some kind of delay going on here. They've totally changed Hangouts again, so welcome yeah. to the new style. Uh, well, hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout. Yeah. For Friday, December 13th, 2003. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> So joining me this week, we've got uh, the core crew, I think. We've got uh, Amy Sure Title. Hello. From Canada. In Canada. In Canada. Go team. Welcome home. Thank you. Got David Dickinson in Florida. Hey. Wishing only he warm. was in Canada. No, wait, it's the opposite. <laughs> only we only wish... warm spot in North America right now. So. <laughs> Jason Major. In Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, a sort of a horrible cross between Florida and Canada. <laughs> we're, just, we're just northern Florida, really. <laughs> right. I'm so confused right now. And Nicole and confused Nicole Gallucci. It you know, happens most it of happens. the time. Most of the time. Uh, cool. So we've got a bunch of stuff we're going to talk about today. I think uh, we're going to talk about the Geminid meteors, which is why uh, David Dickinson looks so tired. <laughs> We're going to talk about the uh, the forthcoming Chinese landing on the moon. Apparently, a rocket, not an entire country or people. So, uh, we're going to talk about uh, crazy jets on Europa. Uh, just another reason why we're not allowed to land on Europa. J E T S. Europa, Europa, Europa. <laughs> Once a jet, always a jet. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, reasons why a star might not be a star. Uh, and then Lakes on Titan. It's just a, a liquidy uh, episode. Uh, an exoplanet with the biggest orbit and a uh, interesting molecular cloud, M51. So let's let's start with the Geminids because we love meteors. So David, yes, uh, why are you so tired? B, because I was out looking for the last few mornings. Uh, I was out on vigil for the Geminid meteors, which is one of the most dependable meteor showers of the year, and currently the Geminids have been getting more and more active every year too, so it's currently one of the best annual showers, even better than the Perseids, but I think the Geminids, due to the fact they happen in December, which is the middle of Northern Hemisphere winter, kind of have a PR problem uh, as compared to the Perseids. But the Geminids, their, their rate right now is approaching up toward, uh, the zenith hourly rate is, uh, in the past few years has been approaching over 120 per hour which is pretty good. So you, you could expect to see one to two per hour depending on how dark your sky is. One problem we have this year is the pesky moon. The moon is at, wa at waning gib or waxing gibbous right now and it's going toward full next week. So we only got a slice of very early morning where there, there's no moon and the sun hasn't risen yet and there's no uh, dawn twilight right now. So And that's dwindling. So that's why I've been trying to get out the last few mornings. I've seen a few. I was looking on the uh, International Meteor Observers uh, Association's website. Uh, their last real-time data came from 12.30 UT, uh, which is 7.30 our time, Eastern time here today. And their zenith hourly rate was showing 63 per hour. And, but that was plus or minus 22, so that tells me that's a very low data set of observers. That's quite of a, a wide uh, distribution right there. But this is an interesting shower to watch for. And this, this shower also is interesting in that it comes from the controversial rock comet 32 Phaethon, which is kind of which which has the behavior sometimes of an asteroid, sometimes of a comet. Uh, it's a comet that gets very close into the sun, closer in than Mercury on perihelion. So it's periodically, what they think is happening is it's getting material baked off it, like ice and things are sub sublimating off it. They also think this might actually be a, a dead nucleus to a comet, a comet that was once active, got captured in the inner solar system. There's a lot of theories, and they didn't know the source of the Geminids until it was uh, astronomer Fred Whipple in the mid-20th century that calculated, uh, based on the orbit, of 32 faith and where the Geminids were probably coming from, what the source body was. So, so when's the peak? What's the best? The peak, the peak is coming at. I always think in universal time. So uh, for Eastern observers, you'll just have to minus five hours right now that we're on standard time. Uh, is uh, two o'clock in the morning universal time tomorrow, which favors the Atlantic because we're going to be turned forward. Uh, we won't be here on the on the on the U.S. East Coast, but on the other side of the Atlantic, it's going to favor uh, U.K., Europe, and then. But you know, the peak really. This shower is a very broad 24-hour peak. It's not like the Quadrinids that come next month, 
which are powerful, but some meteor showers only have a peak that lasts an hour or two. This one usually lasts over 24 hours. I was at a dark sky site in North Carolina, in western North Carolina last year, and I saw quite a few. The shower was one of, one of the better displays of the Geminids or any meteor shower I had seen for some time. Now, and is this I a fire quality two- shower, Dave? Uh, the the average ratio between not it's not exceptionally not compared to the parasites or any there are some showers like the torrids that have a high ratio of fireballs as as opposed to uh, lower magnitude meteors this one's it's it's about an even mix this shower here so I'll be trying to take images tomorrow and and I'll be out again it's clear well I'll admit I'm a total fair weather meteor guy especially <laughs> <laughs> so I love the Perseids. You know, the Leonids and the Geminids really kind of test my patience. I'll go out for a little while and look up, and then I'll get cold and go, ah, wait for summer. Well, it's, it's tough when you're imaging, too, because cold weather will kill batteries in a hurry. And if you're doing time exposures on cameras, that, that will also drain your batteries in a hurry. So I just got a new camera, by the way. Yeah. I got, oh, cool. a, I got a 5D Mark II. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so, so I'm really excited. We're, we're going to use it for shooting video, but... I will also be using it for time lapses and, I, and things like that. So, yeah. I, I usually carry an extra set of batteries in my pocket just to keep them warm. Uh, a lot of people will use external battery packs, or if you're near an AC source, you could have an AC power pack. That'd be another way to. But catching meteors is just a matter of shooting at a very wide exposure, a wide field of view, and it's it's something you can't really plan for. They can appear anywhere in the sky. They're going to radiate from constellation Gemini. That's why they're called Geminids. But you just aim with the widest field of view you can and just do time exposures. With the moon up, too, you're going to probably have to keep the exposures pretty short because they'll yeah. wash out otherwise, unfortunately. Uh, so, oh, there's a little bit of housekeeping I should do before we kind of move on to the next story. Uh, one is I forgot to turn on the Q&A app, so you can't ask your questions to us within the Q&A app, and I apologize in advance because I'm a big fan of it. Uh, except for all the ways that it's complicated and doesn't work. But other than that, it's awesome. Um, so you're going to have to, if you have any questions for us, you're going to have to post. And now there's more places to post because they've changed the way Hangouts work. So, uh, Nicole, you're going to be watching the Weekly Space Hangout, uh, the event page, if there's any comments there. The YouTube, maybe. Watch Twitter. Watch the sky. And I will watch I the, the Google Plus uh on my stream as well, because there's more comments there you didn't even realize. Um, gotcha. this, yeah. So. Yeah, I don't this, have Twitter open. Don't don't count on Twitter. Don't count on Twitter. Okay. And so the, the second thing is, <laughs> now I know Jason showed off this. So here is the year in space calendar uh, from our good friend Steve Karadi. Karadi. Um, anyway, so we're giving away five more of these. We already gave away five more. Five. We're going to give away five more on Universe Today. There's a giveaway on Universe Today. All you have to do is just put in your email address and. Uh, Click join giveaway and then you'll your name's in the in the hat and uh, we'll pick some names in a, in another couple of days. I think we wrap up on six on the sixteenth. So just come and, to the universe today. Even if you don't even if you don't win one, it's definitely worth buying. I mean, I think I think they're selling yeah. for about thirteen bucks and this calendar has more space info than you could possibly hope for. Uh, every day has space facts on it and and I. As someone who tweets a lot about space, I use it for just you know ideas um, as far as like space history and what's what's happened. Yeah. You know, uh, for example, 41 years ago, um, no, 42 years ago today was the final day of the uh, Apollo 17 mission. That's all on there, so yeah. it gives you some good ideas of what's happened. And I know it sounds like like I'm a paid shill, but a- we're actually not. So, so we uh, we just we every year he he releases these calendars and I really like them and I want to support what he's doing and so we give a bunch away and and help him promote it and and no except for the calendar coming to my house no money crosses hand, crosses uh, crosses any palm. So um, the Sounds other like thing, a good holiday gift. <laughs> the other thing which I think is another awesome holiday gift and we're kind of running out of time and it might be even too late is the Kerbal Space Program is on sale for forty percent off today. So on, through Steam. So if you have any interest, this is this video game where you get to experience space flight with these tiny little Kerbals. It's it's like it's a solar system physics simulator <laughs> with a with a bunch of rocket parts, and you can put them together any way you want and try to just do all kinds of missions <laughs> and uh, blow Kerbal, things up and blow I mean, things I up. And, check that out. Yeah, and and kill Kerbals on mass. I I apologize <laughs> to the ones that are they and they're like. Um, they're like plant-based, so they can stay in orbit literally forever. 
and many of mine still are out there orbiting. <laughs> I can't I can't say when I will work up how I'm going to rescue them. They, but yeah, I mean it's amazing to think about. It. Like, how do you do a lander, and how do you get the mission back off the moon and back to the home planet? And it's it's a great game. I highly recommend it. A really active community. It's still an alpha, but it's a very mature. Uh, program. So anyway, and I think it's on 40%. It's like $16 today. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer. So, um, And then the next thing is, Nicole, uh, you've got a app you wanted to talk about briefly. I do. So CosmoQuest has put out a new app for Android users. Sorry, iOS, we're getting to it. Uh, we actually had, had to wait for money to come in so that our developer could get a license. So Joe Moore, one of the developers for CosmoQuest, has finished his master's project, and he passed his presentation this week. Congratulations, Joe. And you can now enjoy the fruits of his master's project as he heads off to graduation tomorrow. The app is called Earth or Not Earth. It's available on the Google Play Store. I'll put a link at the event page and on the YouTube. It is a game that gives you aerial photos. I don't know how well you guys can see this, but it gives you aerial photos of some world in the solar system, and you have to decide, is it Earth or is it not Earth? If you want something more challenging, you can go up to the next one, where you actually have to define what planet or moon or thing it is that you're looking at. Um, there's a matching game. There are vocabulary cards you can learn. You can brag about your scores on Facebook and compete with your friends. This is $1.99 on the Android uh, Google Play Store. Check it out. Uh, it is really fun. I will not challenge... I, I started challenging people to beat my high score, but I actually found most of the images for the app, so that's probably not fair. Right. right. <laughs> but it is, even after doing that, it is super fun. So check out Earth or Not Earth on the Google Play Store. That's cool. And uh, come play with us. And then the last thing is, uh, <clears throat> you know I do this Phases of the Moon app? So we, we're we part of a promotion with this group called uh, Free App of the Day. Many of you probably even have this. So on Monday... Uh, our Phases of the Moon is going to be free on iOS. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, so this is the, this is the one. Bit. So if you have iOS, so this is the Android version, right? But if you have... I like how you included the, the labeled map, too, where you can actually see the... It has the, a permanent place on my, yeah. my Android desktop. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's the Android part. one, and we actually have a free version of the Android one, and we, we, we removed all the ads yesterday, I think, and we had 150,000 downloads of it yesterday. So sure. I think it's going to be a lot bigger even on Monday because their iOS version is even bigger. So on Monday, just remember... Download a free copy of Phases of the Moon if you have an, an iPhone or an iPod or an iPad. So, um, free, free. Merry Christmas. Uh, Very okay, cool. so let's move on to some additional conversations. Thanks, Amy Aiden. Fraser. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's talk about uh, these jets on Europa. Jets on Europa, yeah, this is... Um, this is super cool news. I mean, this is uh, uh, probably one of the one of the big news stories of the year, in my you know, in my not so professional personal opinion. Um, so we all know that Enceladus, Saturn's moons, uh, has have has jets of uh, ice and dust shooting from its south pole. And we've known this since uh, Cassini discovered the jets in 2005. Well, as it turns out, Jupiter's moon Europa. That's the one from 2010, uh, attempt no landings there, also has jets. Now, we don't know exactly um, if they're jets per se, just like Enceladus's. This is still kind of a, a preliminary announcement, but everything's pointing to the fact that uh, Europa, at some point during its orbit around Jupiter, is shooting some of its some of its liquid out into space. Now, whether or not uh, that it, the liquid is water vapor, um, it was detected with Hubble. Uh, so the 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 signatures are of hydrogen and oxygen ions um, that seem to be emanating from the south pole of Europa. Um, now, again, whether or not this water vapor is actually coming up from inside Europa or whether it's uh, coming from melting ice, that, that surface ice, not quite sure yet. So there's still some, some observations that need to be made to kind of tell where it's all coming from. But what's happening is, is, is as Europa orbits Jupiter, it, it, it goes around Jupiter once every uh, three and a half days. It has an elliptical orbit, which means that at some point it's closer to Jupiter than at other points, and when it's closer, it gets gravitationally squeezed by Jupiter's uh, by Jupiter's gravity. Uh, tidal stresses kind of you know squish it, and there's no jets at that point. 
And when it's further out in its orbit, it kind of releases, Jupiter's gravity releases it a little bit. The uh, cracks in the ice potentially open up and spray some of that water vapor out into space um, from Europa's South Pole. The takeaway from this is if we want to sample the potential underground ocean or subsurface ocean that's on Europa, we don't necessarily have to land and drill and send a, a robotic, uh, you know, a robotic probe down under the ice, although that's a good idea. We don't have to do that. All we have to do is fly a spacecraft through these plumes, Cassini-like, uh, to get a taste of what's actually happening inside Europa. So that's the big news, and, um, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic that this news should be coming out uh, on the heels of an announcement by NASA that they're not going to be awarding any new planetary science grants in 2014. So, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like uh, your move now, you know, NASA. <laughs> uh, the research came out of the Southwest Research Institute, obviously planetary science. So now, you know, what are you going to do? Should we, should we go investigate? Probably yeah. should. Yeah, this is gigantic news. This is, I mean, I think this is the story of the year. And, <laughs> and you know, here we are on the last couple of days of, of December. <clears throat> and, and you're, you know, you talked, we actually just completed a bunch of interviews with a bunch of people. We talked to Mike Brown, talked to Emily Lakdawalla. In fact, we just released a video with Emily Lakdawalla, and this is exactly what she said. She said, forget Mars. We want to find life on Europa and Enceladus. That's where we think we're going to find it because you've got water right now hmm. with with You've got water, you've got access, you've got rock, you've got places where chemicals, complex molecules can be forming with chemical and, handy, and energy what's sources. What's handy about, um, about uh, uh, Europa versus Enceladus is, I mean, it's basically about 300 million miles. So you, it, it's just a little bit of a closer proximity to actually get a spacecraft over around Jupiter. Now, yes, Juno is going to Jupiter, and it's going to get there in, uh, I believe, 2016. Unfortunately... Uh, Juno is not necessarily made to investigate Europa. Yeah. Uh, it's a spinning spacecraft. It's going to take a polar orbit around Jupiter. It's not really going to be doing Europa studies. So can they tweak the mission to kind of take a look over there? Yeah, they're going to see what, they're, what they can do with that. But it's not a dedicated mission. So that's what really needs to, needs to uh, kind of get dusted off. Maybe the Europa Clipper mission that was I think on we did the, a Stardust. Like, you remember the Stardust mission that flew through the comet tail and, right, and you know? had the aerogel and grabbed all those particles? Yeah. Well, imagine the mm -hmm. same thing, right? You, you create a, a version of Stardust. Just take the same spacecraft, right? Fire it off to Jupiter, have it just keep flying Jupiter. through Europa's plume, capturing molecules and then have it return to earth and then they can they can examine them. I think this is this is great because because people have always really felt excited about the the potential for there being life underneath the the ice on Europa, but it's just like but how are you going to grind through 10 kilometers worth of ice to get down it's some kind of submarine, do you send a nuclear reactor that melts down? No, yes, Europa is yeah. firing the water into space for you to fly through. This is this is amazing. Yeah, if Europe was giving us the stuff, shouldn't we go get it? Should we go yeah. get it? It's right there. <laughs> it's right there. This is starting you're, you're, to seem stupider and stupider that we're not doing this. Now, you know, again, it's not known whether or not the, the water vapor is originating from the subsurface ocean. So there's, you know, there's a little bit of a science buzzkill here. Um, the, the announcement isn't... Um, it's not the science gold standard of a five sigma, you know, where basically, yes, it's 99.9999% sure that, that this is happening. It's a four sigma, so it's only, you know, 98% sure of, of, you know, actually existing, and it's not noise. So there's, there's more introduction, uh, more uh, observations, I'm sorry, need to be made to see what, what exactly this, this is, where it's coming from, um, and it just shows that, yeah, we, there's more planetary science that has to be made here. Um, and, I mean, to, to, to stop writing checks out to it is going to be, you know, it's going to make that difficult. And, and this is going to be the question of, this is really the, the discovery probably of the year, and it's going to be the big question of next year. And who's going to be, who's going to be researching it? Forget Mars. Let's go to Europa. Jake. I don't care what those aliens say. We are landing. <laughs> 
Jason, there was a paper going around this week, too, that some sort of panspermia or, or exchange of organic material may have occurred between Earth, Mars, and I think they mentioned Europa, too, for that reason about the impact. Well, what they did mention at one point, and I mean, I think this was only last week, they were saying that um, Europa was, uh, could have had some clays deposited on it from a, uh, a from massive Chick impact at one like point. I think like yeah. like the, the yeah. one that wiped out the dinosaurs is, I think, the one they cited, the one 65 million years ago. Oh, yeah. So they're looking at well, there. The, I think there were a couple things. There was there was the idea that that massive impacts on Earth could have sent out um, material to the uh, to the rest of the solar system. It, it would have just made sense that over the course of you know millions of years, that some of the stuff that got blown off of Earth that already had uh, organic molecules and chemistry developed on it could have landed other places. No. And then no. there was the information that uh, that clays could have been dropped on Europa through possibly a cometary impact as well. And they kind of like highlighted a little spot there. They'll land on Europa and find the hubcap that Project Plumbob <laughs> blew off in the 1950s from a nuclear <laughs> explosion, I bet, sitting on the surface. Bigger. <laughs> we have a question from uh, Hugo Burnham. Uh, has the HST looked at Callisto for similar similar plumes, or have any plans to? And I'm wondering the same for Ganymede, because all three, all three of those moons likely have some subsurface ocean. Have you heard anything about that? I, I have not seen anything about Callisto or Ganymede. Mm -hmm. um, the observations were, were really centered on Europa, and the, um, and the observations uh, were all in. It was an invisible light, so it's, again, not like Enceladus, where we can just look at it in the right lighting and see these and see these jets shooting out of the ice. This was all in uh, ultraviolet, um, and it was all signatures of hydrogen and oxygen ions. So <laughs> invisible light, not yet. We we haven't even seen anything. So it's so it's still not quite Enceladus, but you know, again, it, may, it might just need some more observation. Again, there's not a Cassini-like mission around yeah. Jupiter. So you know, anymore. Not yeah. Around, around <laughs> Galileo, we loved you. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, okay. So, Amy, top that exoplanet with the biggest orbit. I can't really top that, but I'll you know, do my darndest. Um, so, yeah, I, I liked this a lot. And, yeah, not enough on the news, so I missed this. But um, astronomers at the University of Arizona found a planet that, by all accounts, should not actually exist. Um, so, this is an exoplanet, um, not a planet in our solar system. I should make that very clear. Um, the planet is called, oh gosh, HD 106906b. Um, we'll just leave it there. So, so it's orbiting its star. It's 11 times as massive as Jupiter, but it's not, it's not the size that's really interesting. It's the fact that it's orbiting its star 650 astronomical units away. So one astronomical unit, of course, is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is about 93 million miles. So this massive 11 times the size of Jupiter planet is orbiting 60 billion, 450 million miles from its Sun. So this doesn't make any sense according to anything that astronomers know about how planets are formed. Because generally planets form right when the, the disk of gas and dust coalesces. Um, the planets closer to the Sun tend to, you know, get gets more of the material and get denser in the planets like Jupiter. Um, it, of, oftentimes we think they are sort of failed stars or planets that sort of, sort of coalesced in sort of the early, like with some big event in the early solar system's early life, but this one just sort of doesn't make sense. Um, so one theory that might explain it maybe is that it's actually a failed star in its own right, more so than Jupiter, um, obviously being bigger. and it would have made a binary system with its star, but it just wasn't quite big enough to start burning and start, you know, become a star, so you ended up with this massive planet really far away from the star, but they ended up sort of gravitationally locked to one another. Um, but the the issue with this explanation is that it's it's too it's too dense for its star to have been formed at the same time in sort of a binary system. So it's it's one of those exoplanets that's, again, like so many of the more recent discoveries, is just completely turning everything we think we know about how exoplanets form and how planets form on its head. It's okay. So we, th we think we know how planets are formed, and then we find this thing, and all of a sudden 
we have to figure out how to explain it and then see if there are other things out there that then fall under this new explanation of how planets are made. So um, this is really cool. I love these stories that sort of take everything we know and tell us that we're wrong. <laughs> well, one of the ideas or one of the one of the problems with the sort of planetary formation idea of these, these idea of these rogue planets, right, that, yeah. that, you know, if you have a lot of matter, a, a star's worth of matter, then it's going to collapse down, it's going to create stellar fusion, and you're going to get a star. And they're easy to find because they're bright. But if you have a smaller amount of matter, like a few dozen Jupiter's worth of, of gas and dust, will that collapse down and will that turn into a planety type thing without a star? <clears throat> and, yeah. and and how do you find them? Because they're not going to give off any kind of radiation. In this case, yeah. it's reflecting light from, from its parent star. Well, but you can this, imagine... Well, in this case, it's actually emitting... It's young enough, actually. Sorry, I sort of uh, mm. glossed over this. It's actually young enough. Um, looking up the... It's 13 million years old, whereas the Earth is, you know... What, 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 how old is the Earth? Four and a half, five, four point five, five, four billion, billion years right? old. Yeah. So it's young. It's actually still emitting infrared light in, or heat rather, in the form of infrared light. So it's it's still kind of glowing, but not um, bright, bright glowing. Yeah, you, um, you touched on it, Amy, yeah. too. Is that it is just below the level for deuterium fusion for a brown yeah. dwarf? I think it's about thirteen to fifteen Jupiter masses usually. So it's yeah. it's just shy of being uh, substellar. Yeah, people always wonder, like, what would it take to to ignite Jupiter and turn it into a star, and all it would take is crashing 13 more Jupiters into it. <laughs> a lot of monoliths. Easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, like that we can talk about something being 14 times the mass of Jupiter as a relatively small <laughs> amount of material. A little, yeah, it's a little guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Let's move well, on. Well, considering that, considering that the 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 sun. It, our sun takes up 99% of the mass in the whole solar system, and everything else, including Jupiter, is in that remaining one some odd percent. Um, you know that mass is. Then it becomes a little easier to envision that that mass is is out there, and you know you could just kind of yeah. chuck it into stuff. Yeah. Uh, you guys are funny. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Doctor Nicole Galusha. Why? Right, because we have the doctor Dr. among us. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just because everything, uh, I I build things and it's hard, but I don't build planets, so. <laughs> In, in my imagination, all this stuff is easy. I know, um, I know. That's why I love you. It drives Pamela crazy, too. <laughs> I'm like, well, we could just do this. Do you know how hard that is to do this and that? That's crazy. Not in my no. mind. It's easy. I just did it. <laughs> you should be a theorist. <laughs> Piece of cake. What, you wanna, do you want to see me imagine something else right now? Done. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, let's move. Let's move on. So, uh, Nicole, do you want to talk about your uh, molecular cloud? Sure. Although I thought that was a good segue for Jason's story, personally. What um, brown dwarfs out of the brown out of the brown dwarf story? Pff, who would who would have picked that up? If, uh, fine, <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Go go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I didn't want to leave Nicole hanging because I'm we're about to concentrate the laser beam of uh, stories on I'll Dave and Jason. This, I'll make this I'm, quick. I'm, I'm, I'm chatting with our commenters. It's fine. I'll make this quick for two reasons. One, because I don't want to leave Nicole hanging, and for two, I don't know all that much about it to go really deep into the into the science behind it. But um, so basically, if we're talking about brown dwarfs. We're talking about stars that quote-unquote have failed. Now, I, I hate that term because it, it implies that there's a test for stars, and I, I like to be a little more egalitarian regarding that. So, it, it's just whether or not this object has gained enough mass to, to start burning, or fusing, I should say, fusing hydrogen uh, at its core. Um, brown dwarfs are much bigger than Jupiter, I shouldn't say, I hate saying this too, it, not bigger, more massive than Jupiter, um, but they haven't ignited yet, so they can't be technically stars. Um, but the trick is, is, is where is that line? You know, science likes to know, you know, black and white. It's, it's you're a brown dwarf, are you a star, are you not a star? So researchers from the university, uh, or, or uh, Georgia State University, um, have pretty much come down to what that boundary line is. And as it turns out, there's a temperature level uh, that is 2100 Kelvin is the kind of the temperature at which a star is no longer a star. It's not a little star. 
it's not a you know it's not a big planet it's a brown dwarf and so that's that's our temperature line there and it's um it's let's see the radius would be 8.7 percent of our sun uh, and the luminosity is tiny I mean the luminosity is one eight thousandth of the sun so these objects are where that line that dividing line between a brown dwarf and a really 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 little star why is that important that's important because of how these objects cool off uh, and, and potentially how they may have exoplanets around them um, and where to look for life uh, elsewhere in the galaxy. Brown dwarfs cool off in the terms of millions of years, whereas if it's actually a star and it's fusing, then it's going to cool off much, much, much slower. If there are exoplanets around these objects, uh, obviously, exoplanets that are that are orbiting a star would have a lot more time for life to develop, or organics to develop, or turn into whatever. Whereas anything orbiting a brown dwarf, if there is something there, I'm not sure if you would call those exoplanets. If they'd be kind of more like moons, that's a semantic debate for another time. But the heat's just not there to make them habitable. Um, the habitable zone would be much, much smaller and wouldn't last nearly as long. So that's our dividing line. This is 2100K uh, is basically the, the end point for a star. Any cooler than that, and you have a brown dwarf. Is that based on what the surface temperature is if there's fusion in the core? Is that like the fusion on, fusion off barrier? Is that, that where they came is. up with that? Well, I, let's see. What are we looking at here? Um, it's it's decreasing temperatures. Um, they're looking at the light. Um, you know what? If you want to know they're, more, check out my uh, check out my article doing, over on okay. first today. They're, uh, they're doing uh, they're doing deuterium fusion too. They're not burning. Yeah. They're not doing the full proton proton chain. They, they, okay. They're doing the very beginning of the proton proton chain, but they can't do the full thing up to helium. So they're just doing two hydrogen atoms into one deuterium. That's two hydrogen hardly and... fusion. <laughs> so is this where we find out that, our, that the sun is no longer a star? No. <laughs> why, why would you say that? I don't know. not a planet. Are... The sun, not a star. The, the, the moon is hollow. The moon's um, hollow. You know, I, have, exactly. I have no mouth and I must scream. All that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, Aliens! Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and one of the interesting things uh, when we're talking about brown dwarfs is how they react to mass. Um, it, you could talk about adding more mass to these things, but it doesn't necessarily make them larger. Uh, as brown dwarfs and objects like that, and even, even things like uh, uh, super Jupiters um, in, in other uh, in exosystems, at a certain point, they don't get any bigger. They actually start to get a little smaller because the mass just starts bringing them in, bringing them in. Uh, it's been liking to springs on a mattress. You put more stuff on it, and they just compress. Um, so you know that's why that's why it's tricky to say large, big, um, because they're not actually bigger. It's just about how much mass they have in them, and that's where the, you know you start talking about whether or not they can fuse. It's 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 that heat, it's that gravity on the inside of them that that gets to that fusion point. Nicole, you can run no longer. Let's talk about your all right, molecular all right. cloud. Well, first, I wanna, first, I want to address a question from Rich Hayward asking about Amy's story. Um, is it possible that, that it's so far out it could be a captured rogue planet? Um, I don't know if you have any comment on that. My guess would be no, because that's really difficult to do. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know either, but thinking about it when I was writing that article, I also thought probably not, because I, I don't really... I can't imagine what where it could have been that something could have passed it to like whip it out of its um, whip it yeah. out of one solar system and then to be captured so far away from a star something yeah. that yeah. Body interaction. So far, that would be body interaction it, it'd have to come pretty close yeah. Yeah. and so that young not. age is going to be tricky like that I mean like I said it's only oh, 13 yeah. million years so you yeah, know it's not, not a lot of time for something like that to develop a stable mm -hmm. orbit yeah. The the Panstar survey did find a rogue planet earlier this year, uh, about 80 light years out. They found it in the no, that was the Wise survey actually, an infrared survey. Yeah, that makes found sense. That. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, okay. So now that's I'll it, talk Nicole. About now, clouds. now can we talk about <laughs> molecular cloud? Yes, we can talk about molecular clouds. I had this. Uh, this was actually a special request from Kakambo. Some concatenation of numbers on Twitter, uh, asking about this story. This is a, a map that I'm going to be showing you. Uh, this is of the molecular clouds mm -hmm. in the Whirlpool galaxy, M51, um, uh, overlaid over... Uh-oh. Nope, we lost you. 
The Galaxy Gutter. Yeah, Galaxy Gutter. <laughs> we see your we see your your Galaxy. She's become before. a Galaxy. We, we can no longer hear you. It looks pretty though. And now we're losing her entirely. <laughs> there we go. There she. There she is. Maybe. This is the alternate. Version this this of this Nicole. is how she yeah this is how she gets out of doing this story fine. Um, <laughs> all a ruse. You're breaking uh, up. Quickly, Jason, while while she's returning, let's talk about this cool lake on Titan, and I'm going to try and show this video. Well, there's a okay. There's a uh, there's a lot this of is lakes. Not on my day. <laughs> <laughs> there there are a lot of lakes on Titan. Um, they're not filled with water like we have here on Earth. They're filled with liquid methane. Um, so, because it's very cold on Titan, it's about 300 degrees below Fahrenheit. Uh, so, you know, that's that's the temperature where gases here are liquids there. Um, and Cassini has done nine years of radar research uh, during Titan flybys, and NASA just uh, put together a really nice video of a flyby or a flyover of Titan's northern uh, northern pole. And as it turns out, almost all of Titan's lakes are in one 600 by 1100 mile uh, region around its North Pole. In fact, only 3% of the liquid on Titan's surface is outside of this region. Uh, so it's basically uh, Titan's version of Orlando Lakes. Uh, I'm listening to some really <laughs> lovely music right now that you okay. can't hear. Um, so here's a flyby or a flyover. It's using colorized radar data, so we're not actually looking at optical data. Um, the radar instrument on Cassini can bounce uh, radar off of the surface of Titan, and it can tell where is you know where smooth surfaces are probably the lake surfaces, and um, and where uh, surface is you know non non liquid surfaces are um, because the surfaces of Titan's methane lakes are extremely, extremely smooth and radar reflective. Um, so they show up. Uh, they show up. I should. I shouldn't say they're radar reflective. They're not radar reflective. They show up as these big dark regions that that have almost no texture to them at all. In fact, they've been likened to the paint on our cars. That's how smooth these uh, uh, these lakes are. Um, now. One of the lakes, Cassini was able to shoot some radar down through to determine its depth. And I want to say, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, I want to say that the depth was determined to be somewhere around 500 feet. So these lakes are a lot deeper, at least in some parts, than, than we even thought they were. Um, they're not just ephemeral lakes that disappear uh, seasonally. I mean, these things are, are there to stay, at least, you know, for a, a long term. Um, so why they're all there in this one zone, um, not quite sure. They, it just may be the part of the tectonics of, uh, of Titan's surface. Um, maybe there was, you know, maybe there, there's uh, uh, divots in the surface uh, that, that, you know, keep it there. Um, so that's just going to be the ongoing study of Titan's lakes. And, uh, yeah, the, the mission, there was that mission, th you know, uh, sailboat for right. Titan's lakes, right? Titan Lake Lander, yeah. Wouldn't that be crazy? That'd be yeah. so great That'd be to have awesome. a sailboat, awesome. yeah, zipping around those lakes and exploring and scooping up liquid methane samples, liquid hydrocarbon samples, and testing them for life. I, I think it'll be great. So one of the, the testament here is is having a mission around uh, around Saturn or studying a, a system for long periods of time, going yeah. through seasonal changes. That's that's the key. It's not just you know it's not just a flyby. It's not just a landing and then the batteries run out. Cassini has been studying Saturn and its moons for nine years now, um, and it, so it's seeing a lot of different things, and it has a chance to make real long-term observations. Uh, that's that's key to understanding what's happening in our solar system. All hail Cassini. <laughs> uh, David, the Chinese yes. are about to land on the moon. Yes, the Chinese are landing tomorrow, or rather, one of their rover, one of their landers with a rover on it is landing. the The Chang'e three probe is landing. The time I'm seeing right now is thirteen ten UT, which is about yeah, subtract five eight ten tomorrow morning Eastern Standard Time. 
Uh, the Chinese national television, CCTV, may be carrying it. What I'm hearing, it's always kind of uh, just check and look to see if they're actually going to be broadcasting this. They don't broadcast every space event, but usually the high-profile ones, they'll do they'll do something near time, if not live time. I don't know if we're going to get images from the surface or how soon that that's going to occur. It's landing in the uh, sinus region of the near side of the moon, which is just being illuminated right now on the waxing gibbous moon. So you can actually go up there tonight and see that one little dark Maria where they're landing their uh, lander and rover tomorrow. And it's actually uh, plutonium power, too. I thought that was interesting that they're, they need the plutonium power source on it to survive the uh, two-week long nighttime on the moon. It's partially solar-powered. Oh, it's a pretty good uh, infographic there. Yeah, so I don't know how your Chinese is. Mine's pretty, pretty Mine's terrible. pretty, yeah, pretty bad. Yeah, but, but, uh, but look, at, look, I mean, what does it look like? It looks like... Uh, Sojourner, right? Looks a lot like Sojourner, yeah. Oh this my will, god, it does! This yeah. will be the last, this will This will be the first rover, the first landing on the moon, soft landing. I mean, we've impacted things over the past few years. Since 1976, the Russians were the last ones to land uh, an automated probe back in 1976. So it's been was a while. Was that a Luna? I think it was. Well, I think it was their sample soil return that the Russians did an automated soil return, I'm pretty sure. And inter interestingly, Laddie will be watching, too, to see how this mm. affects the dust environment of the moon uh, once this lands and stirs up the dust. So it'll Isn't be it? interesting to watch. That's great. Sure and by the end of the weekend, we'll have pictures from the lunar surface again for the first time in Ooh. over 30 years. That's and I'm going to recommend, uh, although she's not here with us today, is Emily Lockta Wallace's coverage of this. She's been all over this. Yeah, it's been, been really, really great coverage yeah. of this. And so go check out the Planetary Society, Emily Lockta Wallace's coverage of this mission is is just perfect. So that's that's fantastic. I mean think about it. Forty forty one years after Apollo seventeen lifted off and and you know we're gonna have a, a another moon. landing. Humans will and, have another uh, landing on the moon. A few weeks ago uh, Universe Today wrote about this and I wrote about it on my site too that South Korea has uh, evinced interest in sending a lander to the moon by twenty twenty two. So they actually did a press release and they showed a small lander that they want to send up there. Which they just orbited their first satellite, their first indigenous satellite, without using another carrier uh, from their own soil last year. So they just entered the space race last year. So now, don't you feel like you're on a roller coaster here where like NASA budget cuts? Oh SpaceX, yay! <laughs> Chinese launching, you know, landing on the moon, yay. India is going to Mars. Yeah, and, well, India's we, going we to Mars. Maven. We yeah. sent Maven off too, so we did send something off to Mars this year. So we we've got a few missions uh, yeah. heading out this year. Now is now is the whole uh, Google uh, Lunar X Prize event? I mean, are they are they you know working this in there, or is this something entirely different? I don't know. I don't know it's, about that. I, I'm pretty sure it's totally different. Totally different. Okay. Because yeah. um, yeah, they have it. I mean. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. this, I mean, they're doing what the what the X Prize is is supposedly, you know, calling Ex for. Except they're doing yeah, it with the yeah. might of a, yeah. of a, a you know, a global superpower, yeah, as opposed <laughs> yeah, to yeah. a small team of people doing it on the on the cheap. So, which was the whole point of the X Prize. Uh, okay, well, one last story, and this is one that's Wait, sort of. Can I try again? <laughs> Sorry, who? Are you, are you going to turn into a galaxy again? All right. <laughs> no, I'm not going to screen share, but can I try again? <laughs> yeah, no, please, please. Okay, I, we, all right. I, I want to wait. finish my M51 story, um, which I showed you and that crashed my laptop. See, I've been kicked out of my office because we're moving, so that's why I'm on my laptop. Anyway, so they did this molecular cloud study over several years using this in a barometer in the Alps. Uh, mapping out the molecular clouds and for the first time getting images of the molecular clouds at a certain scale. We know that really, really dense molecular clouds are what create stars, but they're also these bigger diffuse and they discover kind of this molecular fog. They traced it with carbon monoxide and they use that to trace the molecular hydrogen gas. And we're able to tell from different places and the densities where star formation may or may not be happening. So they correlated it with all the optical data of this galaxy, with ultraviolet uh, data of this galaxy, with infrared images of this galaxy to see where the molecular clouds were either forming stars or not forming stars to really understand more about how that process works. Though we know overall how the process works um, in star formation, we don't know a lot of the details. We don't know how much these giant molecular cloud complexes, why only some percentage of it, so in the Milky Way it's some small percentage uh, that actually turns into stars, why it does that. So this is a really cool study. Again, it's millimeter wave um, interferometry. It's the kind of, uh, this is, uh, 
something that they can look at further with Alma. The problem with Alma is it's so popular. Everyone wants time on it. And so that's why they were able to use the Plateau de Beard instrument to look at this for many, many, many hours over many, many, many years to get that gorgeous map that then crashed my computer. So that is the Molecular Cloud story. I will share that link. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a, it's a beautiful picture. I We Instagrammed it. You Instagrammed it. That's yeah. great. <laughs> that, makes it, that makes it cool. That's that makes just, it better. That was, that was yeah. We, I think we got 100 we, likes. Universe we, Today on Instagram. We we totally missed the drama on the ISS that's going on. Yeah, so that was, the last thing yes. that, I, bef- that was the last thing that I wanted to talk about. And David, you, uh, have you been... Yeah, I, I, I haven't seen the updates today, but I know they lost one of the coolant loops on the ISS a few days ago. I don't know if they ever got it back online. Uh, but they were talking about, last time I saw, me and Jason were talking about this on Twitter Wednesday night, as a matter of fact. They were talking about doing a contingency spacewalk to try to repair it, if they can repair it. I think right now what they're looking at to see if it's even something they, they can go out and repair. But they know I know they're moving ahead with the uh, Antares Cygnus launch next week, so that's a good sign. Uh, but as far as I've heard right now, they're still looking at seeing what they're going to do to repair that. Uh, it's definitely not putting them, it's a redundant system, so they have their cooling still in place. And they're entering into a time of year right now where the, the ISS actually enters into a, its inclination, its orbit is high enough that it goes into full illumination. So heating and cooling is definitely an issue this time of year right around uh, the solstice because they're entering in that time where their orbit is perpendicular to the sun. So they're staying up in full illumination the entire time. And they they can do things like feather the panels to kind of create artificial shadow and things like that. But they they like to have both of those ammonia cooling systems up online. It's kind of putting them in a precarious situation. It could. Right now it's urgent. It's not an emergency, but it's uh, not good. And one of the things that, that uh, people have asked me about uh, conditions on the space station and other you know other spacecraft you talk about I mean, they think that they think that if there's a problem with the HVAC or whatever type system they have there um, that that c- getting colder would be an issue it's actually it's actually uh, keeping it cool because of all yeah. the stuff that they have running in there you know it can get warm inside the uh, inside the ISS so um, you know they want to make sure that, that 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 keeps it down so you know it's not so much loss of it's not so much you know freezing in there it's actually overheating yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, I haven't there, heard of according to NASA right now, and I know you know they're gonna they're gonna say everything's okay even if it's not quite okay. But yeah. but there's not a life threatening situation. I know when it first came out, when the news first broke yesterday, it there was a lot of hand waving about that. But. I haven't seen a lot of talk about it today. I, I think that they unless they changed it and haven't said it yet, I think that they're moving ahead with the Antares mission next week is a good sign. Mm-hmm. That that it's the it's orbital sciences about. launch. Yeah, that, okay. as far as I know, they're moving ahead with that. I, again, I haven't checked in the last few hours. Maybe, maybe they they. I know Wednesday night they were talking about maybe pushing that off a bit. But if they're, that sounds to me like they're still wanting to do business as usual. And I haven't heard talk about doing a spacewalk uh, per se. But who knows? All right. Well, we should probably wrap things up. Um, hopefully, we'll get some more news over this coming week on what hap- what's happening with the space station, and I'm sure it'll be fine. But I like how you said that, right? Like that if you know NASA is going to tell you that everything's fine, even if things aren't fine, and they're telling you that it's fine. <laughs> so, so everything's just fine. Uh, Amy, share title. Where do we find out more? Uh, popular science uh, for now. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> fine. Popular science. Been working on some stuff and haven't been on the internet lately, so popular science is where I'm sort of regularly right now. What kind of stuff? Some some larger format book related stuff that I will talk about later. <laughs> All right, you tell us when you can talk about things. Yes. Yeah. All right, David Dickinson. Oh, this week I was active on my own site, Astro Guys with the Z, Universe Today, Listosaur, Canada.com. And I'm heading out of here to do a school star party tonight. And I'd just like to give a PSA that if you're a teacher and you're having a parent-teacher's night, having a star party is a great idea to just to kind of ease the tension a little bit. I, every time I've, see, I've seen schools do this and do a parent-teacher's night and do a star party, it usually turns out that people actually look forward to parent-teacher's night. So There is nothing more calming and fun than a telescope set up as, uh, as a out teacher, front of the parent teacher te- night. As a teacher, I can tell you myself that people generally, parents and teachers, generally dread parent teacher's night. 
and it can make it a little bit of fun. That's awesome. Jason. I am More at, Jason. I am at, as always, at lightsinthedark.com. I also write for Universe Today, and uh, I should be back on Discovery News space uh, come, the, come 2014. Um, and I'm on Twitter, at JP Major, so you can... Yeah, you can find uh, you can find all sorts of space news and stuff by following me because I have no life and I just tell everybody all about space. <laughs> Want some friends? The fire is job. There is no better life. You're having a your <laughs> life, a life right now, this hanging is, out with your best is friends. Right here, uh, it goes as far as this, and it goes as far as this. So <laughs> we're right. Well, right all right of here. us can say the same. So. We can all say the same thing. Yeah, this is. You think you're watching a show about space? We're just hanging out with our friends. <laughs> Uh, Nicole, where do we find out more? I have no idea anymore because my office is in the middle of a move. <laughs> I'm somewhere. I still live at CosmoQuest.org. It's where I do all my work. Uh, come check out, again, the Earth Without Earth app. Uh, my website's NoisyAstronomer.com. Hopefully I will also be blogging for Discovery News starting in 2014 because I'm pretty sure Ian O'Neill is really tired of <laughs> carrying the entire Bring us back. <laughs> we, we, will, we, we can't wait to write for you guys again. So, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll be doing that again soon. But check out CosmoQuest. And hopefully next week I will be in my brand new office with my own office, and it'll be great. Fantastic. Yay. Cool, and of course, I am uh, the publisher of Universe Today. You can find out more at universetoday.com. Uh, we've been releasing a mountain of videos on our YouTube channel, which you're watching right now. Uh, we had some a great interview with Emily Lakdawalla this week about uh, where we should search for life in the solar system, and she predicted the Europa thing, so it's great to see that. And uh, next week, we've got an interview with our good friend, Dr. Thad Zabo, and then after that, Ian O'Neill, and then after that... Kevin Grazier, so it's great. We got a ton of really interesting interviews coming out. So all that stuff that we did down at YouTube, it's all it's all going to be happening now. So, so uh, thanks everyone for uh, for watching this week, and we will see you all next Friday. Goodbye. Yeah. If, Happy Geminids. If we can, I don't know if people are going to be around for Christmas. I'm not sure. Anyway, we'll figure it out. See you guys later. I'll be unpacking my office.